Good afternoon. Welcome to Finding Happiness in Hard Times. I'm Ken Burtness, and I'm coming to you from Holly Eva out at the North Shore. Today, we have a great uh, show coming for you. Uh, our guest is Cherie Magnus, and she was with us back in May. And uh, she told us in May about the joy of dance. And I'm really happy to have her back because we're going to take it in a different direction today. Welcome to the show, Cherie. Thank you so much. So happy to be here in Los Angeles where it's cooking. <laughs> it's <Yeah>. cooking. <laughs> cooking. Well, here it's about ready to storm. I don't know uh, how we're both going to do, but hopefully the gods will be with us and uh, make us feel okay for the next half hour. Uh, that first show in May was just, uh, I think it certainly made me feel the joy that you felt in dancing. And I think it made the audience feel the same thing too. Uh, and you wrote three books about it, uh, this great trilogy uh, that took us through your life with dance, and it was wonderful. And then all of a sudden there's a fourth book, which is much different. Uh, it's not nonfiction, it's fiction. Uh, and it's not about dance, it's about climate change. And uh, in it are two very different and interesting heroes. Uh, and it's just a, a wonderful book. And uh, during the last show, we mentioned it uh, briefly at the end of the last show. And uh, I was hoping that might be a good place to start, Cherie, just to, to pick it up and for you to tell us a little bit more about that fourth wonderful book about Lincoln and Rachmaninoff walking into a bar. Yeah. Oh, yes. Well, it brought me a great deal of joy, Ken, to write it. And um, the idea came to me kind of midway through the pandemic, like three years ago. And, you know, we were all doing a lot of fantasy then because we had to just stay inside and couldn't could live our lives fully as we were used to. And so I was thinking a lot. Well, I always think a lot, but somehow, I mean, Rachmaninoff has always been my favorite composer. I love all the Russians, but Sergei Rachmaninoff is number one to me. And Abraham Lincoln has been my hero my whole life. So I was thinking about both of those men for some reason. And then the thought occurred to me, well, what do they have in common? Because they were both very, very tall and they were both depressed. And so I started researching and found out all the things they had in common. And the more I found out about them, the more that I wanted to, they were still my heroes, but I wanted to put them in a story. And I thought, wow. My goodness, if anybody can save us, can save the world from climate change, it can be these iconic heroes. And since I live in California and I'm Los Angeles, and we have such beautiful nature and countryside and cliffside and beachside here, um, I pictured that they were going to ride in a Lincoln Continental starting an Angel's Flight in downtown LA, driving north and along the way meeting uh, the ghosts of indigenous peoples, uh, archangels, getting their mission from God. And uh, yeah, so the more I thought about it, the more I researched it, the more fun I had with the fantasy and I ended up writing this novella. Wow, it was a, a wonderful read. I can tell the audience that for sure. Uh, oh, Sheree is a librarian and uh, <clears throat> She did a lot of research for this, and uh, sure did. Rachmaninoff and uh, Lincoln are favorites of mine as well. Uh, there was a lot I learned in this book that she brought to me, not only about the facts of their life, but uh, Cherie, you made them come to life. You gave them a personality uh, with the way they talked and the way they interacted, and it was like, uh, okay, they sort of came off the page, and they were people. And that was the wonderful thing about the book. That was my goal, Ken, because I, I tried to use as many of their own words as possible. Later on in the story, they meet Ulysses S. Grant. And so he comes into the story and he has a lot to say also. But I use their own words from their letters and their speeches. And I like to think that the characters were alive on the page, you know, that that was their true personalities coming out, even if those events never happened uh, in terms of going up Highway 1 in, in a Lincoln Continental. So well, you, 
you certainly succeeded. That was for sure. And that's the wonders of library. We had uh, the joy of uh, libraries on uh, a number of months ago, and uh, it's one of my favorite places. And interestingly enough, there's a lot of books being written about libraries now. Libraries is a central focus. And uh, to be honest with you, the library, the local library that I volunteer at over at Wailua is not only a place to find books, but it's a place to think. It's a place to imagine. It's a place to walk in and people know your name. And uh, it's like a second home. It, libraries are are magical. And uh, you certainly <laughs> use that magic to uh, to bring these two people uh, to life. And it was it was a wonderful trip. So tell us about the trip, especially the Blue Continental. Now there's a famous, there's a car that I'd love. So <laughs> and that must have been fun riding in that, at least uh, through your your main character who's sort of- Well, uh, I hope they had fun. Um, there's the front of the car that they, they all ride in and they, they pick up a couple of people along the way. But yeah, I thought the Lincoln has to ride in a Lincoln, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, I would like to say, too, that um, because the first three books were memoir, nonfiction, every single word had to be true. Um, maybe a conversation was remembered, but the essence of it was true. The events were true. Maybe I changed a few names, but it's all true. Now, when you're writing fiction, and especially if it's fantasy, you can just put whatever you want. It's so liberating. It's so joyful, Ken. Exactly. And I had never written fiction before, and uh, I love the freedom of it. Hey, I want they can do this or they can do that. It doesn't matter. It's all you know. It also makes a point. So I had a great deal of fun. It kind of saved me from the depression I had, the funk that I was in during the pandemic years. So, well, that, I think that's the real key. I think that, uh, and that's what we're hoping to do on, on all my shows, is to get people out of that uh, dark space that the pandemic, uh, COVID, and all the other things that are depressing us today, from the war to the, you know, certainly climate change, uh, and to everything, the mass shootings, uh, and people need to get out of that. They need to find that freedom. Um, and that's the subtitle of our show today is the, uh, you know, is the magic of a free imagination. And your book freed my imagination as it did yours. And I hope the certainly uh, when the audience reads it, they should feel their imagination being freed as well. Uh, it's just a, a wonderful way to, to do that. The fiction has always been one of my key favorites because uh, it allows us to go beyond the depressing into the hopeful. And I'm a hopeful type of person. <laughs> and your book certainly made me hopeful. Oh, well, I, 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 I mean, it did feel hopeful to me to write that. It wasn't doom and gloom. So I hope other people, I mean, maybe it's not the perfect answer, um, but it's one way to approach it. You know, um, Rachmaninoff really believed in the power of music and Lincoln did too. And Lincoln had such a way to work with people. He could get people to work together, you know, even people on opposing like the North and South. Eventually they worked together. And I think if they were around today, they knew the trouble that we were in, that they could do something to help. But there's all kinds of ways to help. And we can't just say, oh, well, what can I do? I'm just one person, I'm nobody. Everybody can do something, and if we all do something, then maybe we can save the world. I don't know. Yep. And I think we do it by uh, example. And I think your example of letting your imagination go and and thinking not negatively about climate change, like you say, not thinking that uh, this is a problem we can't solve, but uh, let's think about it. And let's think about it differently. And that's what imagination does. It gives us a different perspective, a different idea. Um, tell us about the joy you felt when uh, you were, uh, along with your characters, traveling down that uh, that highway going north and uh, seeing things and uh, hoping about the, uh, the, the future with uh, new music and new words to go to that music to inspire people. Well, I too believe that 
music can change people, music can change the world. We spoke last time about the power of music in my personal life. So that's not to say it doesn't have power across, across the world, you know, it's how we harness it. But fantasy, um, fantasy, thinking about, when I go to the LA Phil at Disney Hall, and I'm sitting there listening to Stravinsky or whatever is being played, uh, I'm in another world, I'm fantasizing, you know, because fantasy, you can escape, you can find solace, you can reflect on different things. Um, it's inspiring and it liberates our minds. It opens our minds to other possibilities. And it also unites us in a community. And uh, I, even though I don't especially read a lot of fantasy myself, you know, because today in the library, fantasy is extremely popular, but it's fantasy of zombies and dragons and witches and things like that. And so, but there's all kinds of fantasy. And uh, I think it's very healthy. I, I know the first book that I remember reading and I read very early um, and enjoyed reading. First, my first reading was comic books and Little Lulu and Scrooge McDuck and stuff. But the, well, my first real book was Ozma of Oz. No. That's, I mean, no, that's pure fantasy, of course, but I became in, obsessed and I collected all the 14 original Oz books and all the, you know, I knew every character by heart. And that was the, the start of my uh, love of those worlds. And then uh, when I went to the bookmobile, I got Freddy the Pig books and the Lilac Fairy book and all that. But then as I matured, um, I didn't read fantasy so much anymore. I, I know you, you're a real fan of fantasy movies, aren't you? Yeah. Well, fantasy books, and I started the same place you did, uh, you know, uh, not with Ozma of Oz, but with The Wizard of Oz, the first book in the series. And uh, and I, too, have the whole set. In fact, I used to belong to The Wizard of Oz Club, which was an international uh, Didn't know. international club. And uh, so, yeah, it's... Uh, and they took us places that we never thought we'd go. Not only the first one, which was, of course, the most popular, but uh, the road to Oz, which uh, Tip started out with and uh, wound up at the end of the book to be Ozma at the end of the Land of Oz, which was the second book. And it was an amazing journey uh, through Oz and opened up opened me up to so many different uh, thoughts and fantasies. Um, I can tell you a very embarrassing story now that you mention it about the LA, or the LA Philharmonic uh, when I was young. Um, to give you an idea of the fantasy that I, I got into, uh, which was very early on. And although I lived in the Valley, uh, <clears throat> they had a special program that would uh, bus, be, bus kids into the LA Philharmonic for a uh, matinee uh, performance. And um, especially for the kids in this city schools in Los Angeles. So I did that first when I was in the fifth grade and took the travel from uh, the Valley into uh, the LA uh, Philharmonic. And uh, we, that was the first symphony I attended at in fifth grade and uh, it was a wonderful experience. So I and my friends are sitting in a row. I'm on the aisle seat and uh, I close my eyes. And I let the music flow through me and I imagine things that the music brings. And uh, one of my compatriots says, hey, Bernice is sleeping, you know, wake him up. And I said, no, no, you got it wrong. I'm not sleeping. But what you do, if you close your eyes, you can put a fantastic story can unfold guided by the music that you're hearing. And they said, oh, really? So they all tried it. So I'm sitting there and all my friends, there was about five of them, were sitting there with their eyes closed, listening to the music. And unbeknownst to us, uh, an LA Times photographer was there photographing the audience and took our picture and uh, wrote a story for the LA Times about uh, the yeah. LA Philharmonic's, uh, you know, work with uh, young children, introducing music to young children. They still do. And uh, they showed lots of pictures of children just looking rapt at the uh, the symphony and just getting into it, you know, and 
and then they came to us. Ours was the last picture, and it showed us with our eyes closed. <laughs> and there was a caption that had all Z's in it, like, "Oh, these kids are bored. They're sleeping through the thing," you know. And I was, you know, and I was flabbergasted. I was saying, "No, we weren't sleeping. We were imagining." But they, the uh, photographer, of course, didn't ask us what we were doing. They just assumed we were sleeping. It was so. a good shot. Yeah. Yeah. And it made a good story, but, uh, you know, it was not true. That was a little nonfiction, a uh, little fantasy in their story because we weren't <laughs> sleeping. We were, and it was beautiful music, you know, it was just sitting in that, uh, the Civic Auditorium at that time, you just listening to the LA Philharmonic was incredible. Yeah. I'm so grateful. You see who I'm wearing here? Here's Dudamel. Ah. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> He's leaving us. Yeah, so um, the first classical piece that I remember hearing, I don't know if I mentioned it before, but um, I had a record called Sparky's Magic Piano. It was an album, 78, you know, 78, re re I don't know how many, there are three or four of them in, in a folder. Yeah. And uh, So it was about a little boy who had a magic piano. He wanted to practice piano and so his piano said okay you don't have to worry about practicing I'll play for you so he takes the piano on tour and then does all these amazing performances and then the piano decides not to play anymore so what I remember mostly is and there were a lot of different excerpts of classical pieces on there but I remember Rachmaninoff prelude in C sharp minor I was five years old and I just you know it just uh, shone a light on me and started me off my journey, my Rachmaninoff journey, or as oh, I call him, Rocky. Yeah, Rocky. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> yeah. uh, they've already used that title in a different kind of movie, but uh, yeah, I like the, I like the <laughs> name. <laughs> well, it's Rocky with an I. Yeah, <laughs> and he certainly, uh, you know, he certainly scored a knockout with a lot of his, uh, you know, with his pieces. Just incredible stuff. But do you know what, Jim? He, uh, his music was considered hacked, hackneyed uh, in the mid-century. Yeah. And um, he was out of favor. They didn't want to program his music at the symphony. And they wanted him to write for movies, which he refused to do. And so they hired other people to write similar music. But uh, now he's completely back in favor and every season has Rachmaninoff and as a matter of fact next week is Rachmaninoff night at the Hollywood Bowl and uh yeah so I guess if you wait long enough <laughs> if you don't <laughs> die too soon you know you can uh, get your fame and fortune eventually yeah and even if you die uh that you know you can come back and uh you know, like yes, and save and the world. And be famous, yeah, and save yeah, the world. Save the world. <laughs> and he and Lincoln got along, you know, once yeah. they got to know each other. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> they were both outliers. They were both different, and you know, and I, I certainly related to that because I was an outlier in school. You know, uh, so was I. Yeah, and I think that's why we uh, had such a good time together because, uh, <laughs> you know, it wasn't that I didn't like the people in the other you know in the in group i didn't you know the athletes and all that other sort of you know the stuff the people with money and people with power and uh all that sort of stuff the people who were in uh it was just that i was okay just being with everybody and that's what my folks taught me and uh my mother taught me started reading to me when i was an infant and started playing music on you know on their 78 rpm a uh, little phonograph uh to me and she didn't do a lot of uh kid stuff though she did a lot of adult stuff i started with you know for one of the first authors i remember is oscar wilde <laughs> not oh, usually wow. kids not usually well, he a kid's book. fairy tales though he did the gentle yeah gentle. and he poetry is poetry and uh just uh just wonderful stuff so oh, but man. they played a uh, classical music from the beginning and the first time i heard uh a classical piece was when I was about three or four and I didn't understand it but I just it made me sore it was uh Edvard Grieg uh in the Pier Gint Suite and he was playing uh in the Hall of the Mountain King and uh when that piece started and uh it starts slow and then builds up and gets builded up and and then to this thunderous climax 
And, you know, and I can just remember feeling joy, but not understanding at all. And then by the time, you know, like when you talked about about five years old, I knew that by then I had heard the story and knew the story and had built my own story. I had decided that I would be the person who tackled to go into the mountain and tackle the troll king and save the damsel, you know, and uh, that's what I was doing at five years old. And the music just carried me right through it. That's wonderful. Yeah, it made me, you know, it, it, music makes me sore. And uh, <laughs> and Rachmaninoff makes me want to feel in love. <laughs> well, you know what he said? He said, music is everything. Music is love. Yeah. And I certainly felt it, you know. If I wanted to, uh, you know, be romantic with a lady that I was dating, I put on Rachmaninoff. And, uh, <laughs> nothing like it, you know, just, uh, wow. Funny. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, Rachmaninoff. Bah, 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 bah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. If you take a look at the second or third symphony, you know, the movements in there, some of that stuff are the most beautiful pieces. That, he was uh, a great uh, melody writer. Great. Yeah. Writer. Yeah. So, oh, so nobody ever tried to seduce you with the classical music? Nope. <laughs> well, they took me to concerts, and that was seductive. Yeah. And speaking of which, the first time I heard Rachmaninoff live was the LA Philharmonic. It was at the Shrine Auditorium. I was 17 years old, and they were doing what they called, uh, uh, what do they call um, the concert where they play first, and then they have dancing afterwards. Um, Oh, I can't remember what they what what that kind of an evening is. They don't do them anymore. But one of the pieces they played at the Shrine Auditorium was uh, Rhapsody on the Theme of Paganini by Rachmaninoff. Yeah. I said, oh, my God. Oh, my God. What is that? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Then I heard it a hundred times in movies, you know. It's a very favorite love theme yeah. in all kinds of different movies. But it, he did it. He did quite a memorable job when he wrote that. He made Paganini, uh, uh, you know, famous. famous. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you know, something really interesting about him, and I, I learned, a, I mean, I knew a lot about both men, but now I know a lot more because of all the research I did. But once he escaped uh, from the, Russia and he came to the United States, he only wrote one piece. So he, he had all those decades here when he he played all his concerts. He had to make a lot of money to pay for his caviar and his Russian lifestyle. But he didn't compose. He wasn't inspired until the year before he died. And he composed symphonic dances. But all the other pieces he composed in Russia or Rome or Switzerland. Wow. So we just didn't inspire him here. You know, he was Russian to the core. He wanted to go home. He wanted to be buried there and he wasn't allowed to be. So he had a very sad life. And so did Lincoln, actually. With all of his success, he still had a sad life. And so they talked about, together about their regrets. Yeah. yeah. Along with Ulysses Grant's regrets, too. So yeah. I guess we all have those. As After we die, we can look back and regret, but but it's sure alongside uh, alongside regrets are also joys, and it's psychologically it's much easier to remember the negative than it is the positive. It takes work to go back in and remember those wonderful times, like you were talking about. Uh, you know, uh, and we, you know, it, it's not easy. It's easy to go back and think of things that we did wrong or things that we regret, but it's, there is, you know, but it's worth the time. Uh, and speaking of time, we're sort of running out of time here. And, uh, you know, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about, uh, you know, what you might recommend for uh, the audience to be inspired to uh, open up their uh, imagination and uh, and hope. Uh, that's one of the things we really push in this show is uh, hope for the future and hope for itself. Um, so any last uh, any last thoughts on that? We certainly... We certainly covered uh, or talked about uh, music giving us hope. Uh, what were some of the other things that gave you hope 
uh, when you look back and start opening up your imagination to the possibilities of uh, traveling down in that blue Lincoln? Well, I think that we have to look, we can't just look for big things. Uh, we have to look for little things. We have to see the little things that come across our past every single day that we can make a difference by doing, by being kind to some homeless person, by shutting off the water when we brush our teeth, just recycling our stuff and voting. I think voting for the right person is very important. And to make sure once that we have our candidate elected, we keep after them and make sure that they're following through with their campaign promises. Because we need big things done with big, powerful people and lots of money, but we also need little things done by the little people like you and me. I mean, when you think about it, the world really doesn't need oil. We don't need oil, but we need water. Yeah. Ultimately, we need water. Yeah. So it comes down to the basics, doesn't it? It does. <clears throat> And unfortunately, uh, if there's any time discrepancy, if we say to ourselves, well, you know, we'll deal with that later, you know, which we've been doing for a long time, yeah. uh, you know, we we're gonna wind up in a place that's untenable. And uh, that's why what you're saying is the place to start and the place to be a role model for people is to do the small things that help so that everybody gets together and does those small things and then it becomes a much, much bigger Big thing. thing. Yes, exactly. So well said, Ken. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being with us, uh, Cherie. It's just My so pleasure. good being with you. And, uh, it's fun. Yeah, and smiling and laughing. And uh, and I think that's a key thing to uh, to deal with all this stuff is to uh, to sit back and let things, let the laughs come and let the imagination open up and, uh, and life, and it will be much better for us and a lot of people around us too. So thank you and again. And find, find our happy place. Yes. Whether it's the library, whether it's uh, Disney Hall with the LA Film and Light, whatever it is, find a happy place for you. Yeah. And That's go there cool. and fantasize about how you can make the world a better place. Absolutely. And uh, libraries are a great place. And, and thanks not only for being with us, but being a librarian and helping people find that magic in the library. I love it every day. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. <laughs> and thanks to all the people at Think Tech Hawaii, Jay and Paley and Michael and Carol and Ash and all those people. Uh, we really appreciate your help and support in this as well. And especially we want to thank the people in the audience here who tuned in and been with us and spent some time with us because we've enjoyed being in your living room and wherever you're at. Uh, and I hope that, to see you in two weeks uh, back at the same time, same uh, day. And uh, we're going to have a topic that I think you'll enjoy a lot because it's going to be on the joy of hiking here in Hawaii. Hope to see you then. Wow. Oh, wow. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.